we know that it's a very busy time of year for you, so we appreciate you taking time out of your hectic schedule to join us. We're two weeks out from what many consider to be a very important election season, so it's great to have you with us here today. Towards the end of this interview, I'll ask you some questions that have been provided to me by the attendees. Okay? Um, so welcome to everyone who's joining us today via Zoom for our third fireside chat. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Representative Duran, he represents District 112, which includes Key Biscayne, Brickle, The Roads, Coconut Grove, and portions of Coral Gables, to name a few and serves on the Healthcare Appropriations Committee, Health Innovation Committee, and Commerce Committee, to name a few. He's a Florida Gator and fellow attorney, having graduated from New York Law School in 2008. He's currently campaigning for his third term as state representative for District 112. Representative Duran, welcome. So let's start with asking you um, some background questions. Who or what influenced you to become a lawyer? Sure. So, you know, I, uh, it's good to be with you and, and thanks for having me. Uh, always, always uh, uh, love to love to do these kinds of talks and, and conversations. So it's, it's a, an honor to be uh, joining all of you today. Um, so my, my deci decision to jump into law school uh, kind of originated through what I think is my mom. My mom was not a lawyer, uh, but she was a public school teacher for 32 years. Uh, and I always threw saw through her as someone who was chief advocate for her two sons, but also for her class, her students. Uh, it was called uh, the class that she would have. They used to call it slow learning disabled, SLD. Uh, and she dealt with a lot of kids who had learning disabilities. Uh, and oftentimes she would be having conversations or not conversations, arguments and, and bucking uh, the school board and, and school, uh, the, you know, the county school board and and folks saying she's not these students are not getting what they need and uh, oftentimes she would be uh, speaking truth to power in many respects to try to get what they could get in terms of services and support uh, and so it was through her uh, that instilled in me this idea of how do we help our uh, our community how do you help folks within the community other than just yourself um, and and it kind of stuck with me over the course of, of college uh, uh, that there was something I wanted to do and that was to help people uh, and, and so I decided to go to law school to, to do just that. Okay, great. So when you were in law school, you knew that you wanted to be a politician. Uh, is that correct? Or, you know, what led you to run to, for Florida House specifically? Yeah, uh, so I, I would say, um, no, I didn't want to know if I wanted to be a politician. In fact, I didn't think I wanted to be one at all, actually. Um, what I uh, ended up doing is I went to law school, I came back, uh, while I was in, in law school, I was clerking for a law firm uh, up in uh, New York City. Uh, they were doing a lot of insurance litigation, working and representing a lot of uh, clients who had been impacted, uh, commercial organizations and, uh, and companies who had been impacted by World Trade Center 9-11. Um, uh, and so we were dealing with these really high level, sophisticated claims. Claims. Um, and really kind of got dive, dove deeply into those sorts of issues. Uh, and when I came back down here in 2009, the economy was collapsing. And so I thought of myself, uh, I just need to get a job, make sure I have a good job and get, get, get going. And so I got a, a job at a law firm down in Miami-Dade, was there for a couple of years. I think for me, what I decided was I wanted to try something else before I dove deeply into law. And so a couple of years later, I left and went to nonprofit sector and started working with a guy named Dave Lawrence. He's the former publisher of the Miami Herald. Uh, and uh, his political strategist was a, a guy named uh, Sergio Ben Dixon. And Sergio was a well-known pollster in Latin America and in uh, politics in general. Uh, and he kind of got it out of me that I should try something else. Uh, he's like, you're gonna, be all, all, you're gonna be able to practice law. Uh, you, have a, you have your degree, you've passed the bar, you, know, you passed the, uh, the exam, you're good, uh, but uh, try something else. And so he kind of, uh, and we were just about to have my first child, uh, Mason. Uh, and so we were like, yeah, why, why not? Let's dive into something while we're, we're young and we have uh, a little bit of opportunity. So during that process of working in the nonprofit world, and it's been 10 years now that I've been in this world as a nonprofit executive overseeing several organizations, um, it's then engaging and advocating with uh, elected officials uh, that were, uh, it, it's in that sort of uh, idea of being up in Tallahassee, having five minutes to kind of pitch what you think is an important issue. And for me, the issues were investment in early childhood education, 
reducing barriers to, uh, to access to healthcare for children. Uh, and you would go up there, you'd have five minutes, you'd pitch it, and the legislator would either be like enthused, they'd be all about it and thinking about how important those issues are and wanting to be a champion and empowered, or they would have a glaze over their eyes and just be like, when's this going to end? Uh, and I think that those people who were sitting there staring at their watches were the ones who left an impression in me that, you know, if I had meaningful time with someone like that uh, in the floor, on the chamber, walking around the Capitol with them and engaging them, having a real working relationship, I bet you I can change their perspective or thought and help prioritize, help them in their own mind prioritize issues and policies like these. Uh, so it was a, over a couple of years of advocacy work that really made me think about that. And then Dave, um, you know, he is a forthright upfront person and, and, and he kind of really did instill in me a lot of thinking about what does leadership look like? Uh, and I always thought of myself as the guy in the background helping make things happen. And he said, no, Nick, I need you to step up. I think uh, he kind of, kind of put into me the idea that I should be stepping up to think about these and be a, for a voice. Uh, and um, the stars kind of aligned, so I decided to run for office back in 2016. Awesome. Yeah, I know how frustrating that can be when you're up there in Tallahassee and you're talking about some serious issues and you feel like it's not really being paid much attention to. Um, but just to kind of go back a little bit about your work in the nonprofit se profit sector, uh, prior to being a representative, as you said, you held a number of leadership positions in healthcare policy and community engagement. How have your roles in Enroll America and the Children's Movement of Florida shaped your perspective on health? Yeah, so, you know, when I, when I left into the, we actually, you know, I was young and we were just about to have our first child uh, and, and an actual very personal experience. When I think about healthcare, I think about how personal experiences and how uh, with healthcare, uh, they, they really do drive your thinking about the system, the policies, health insurance, all of those different things. And, uh, you know, we were uh, a couple of years in uh, and my wife and I were pregnant with what was supposed to be our second child. She ends up having a, uh, a miscarriage about 20 weeks in, uh, and she's in the hospital. We have some associated, some uh, other issues, healthcare issues that she was dealing with. Uh, and so it was a dark, dark, deep time in our lives. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things that I look back at and I think was a silver lining was the estimation of benefits, the EOB, that you get in the mail uh, that comes from your insurance company that says this is what you what we covered uh, with this health care uh, with your health insurance this covered all of these services and what we saw was something that said it racked up close to sixty thousand dollars in medical services and health care services that we were only on the hook for about four thousand bucks because we had health insurance and that struck me because at that moment in time if my wife and i and my young son were stuck with a sixty thousand dollar bill uh, it would have changed the entire dynamics of how we lived, where we lived, where my son went to school. Uh, it really would really throw you into, a, uh, into an economic whirlwind. And for many families, that would be the case. And that really, really kind of stuck with me. Uh, and, and I dived into Enroll America. I was recruited to help implement the Affordable Care Act in the state of Florida. And for me, healthcare is this. It is uh, the economic security. It, it is a, a form of economic security that allows families a, a sense of security, an ability to ensure that their family does not go into uh, financial detriment, into bankruptcy, simply and solely because they had some level of a, uh, of a healthcare issue that happens. Because I, I know it's a matter of, it's not a matter of, of if, it's a question of when you have a healthcare issue. So that's always been informed, informed my sort of thinking of healthcare uh, and, and help kind of drive policies related to healthcare when I went up to Tallahassee. Great. Yeah, I mean, and I want to touch on that a little bit as we move forward, but um, I just want to ask you quickly about, you know, since you've been in Tallahassee working as a representative, uh, what are some of the accomplishments that you've had that you're most proud of, whether it's healthcare or, or anything else? Sure. So I would say um, the first is, is before I got into healthcare was helping implement the Affordable Care Act in this state. And State of Florida has led the nation in uh, with the ACA in the marketplace, um, and obviously, I you know I still believe there's lots of flaws and fixes that need to happen with the Affordable Care Act. But so many people in the state of Florida, for the first time, were actually able to access health care for them and their families, have the dignity of a medical home, to have a relationship with the doctor, uh, and to have a sort of a leadership role in helping make that happen was was so critical to me, and and, and so something I'm always going to be proud of. While I've been in the legislature. 
it's sort of been my guiding North star is how do I help with policies that, um, that, you know, I'm a Democrat and, and there's just that, like I'm a Democrat and the, the Republicans are in control of the legislature and the governor's mansion. And so um, how do you operate? How do you be effective in this world? And I think one of the most critical things is, is you have to be willing to listen and learn and work, uh, roll up your sleeves and work with my, my, my colleagues on the other side. And the good thing is the bills that I've been able to are bills that expand access to healthcare, access to medicines, um, but have unanimous bipartisan support. So the Prescription Drug Donation Repository Program, which we passed this past session, is a bill that actually changes law. In Florida, we had, prohib we had we prohibited folks, um, prohibited uh, closed circuits, sort of uh, nursing homes and closed pharmacies that work in service nursing homes from being able to donate unused, safe medicines that are still in blister packs, all of those different things. Uh, and we're talking about tens of millions of dollars that are of medicine every year that gets taken in by a third party and, and incinerated. Uh, what we were able to do and work closely with a, my colleague from Jacksonville, a Republican, is we were able to revise the law. We worked with several different organizations. We tweaked it every, it took us three years, but we got to that point last session where we passed this with everyone on the floor support where we're now gonna create that kind of access to medicines, which is a major issue for a lot of folks that's going on. Um, so uh, I think my major, the thing that I'm most proud of is the ability to work together. And, and, and when you see and you hear like the kind of divisiveness and the kind of uh, how we're all spread apart these days uh, um, and people are with their backs, I think that there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot more that we agree on than we disagree. And it's about rolling up your sleeves, listening, learning, and developing those kinds of, and cultivating those kinds of relationships. Okay, so, and what's on the horizon for you, right? You've spoken about some of the accomplishments that you've been successful with, but, you know, what are some things that you're kind of kicking back and forth right now and you're hoping to get support to eventually pass? Sure, so um, I think uh, when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to COVID, I think the idea is this, in my book, it is we need, if we want to go back to normal, if we want to have some sort of sense of normal, so we all need to have some confidence in us being safe, and that our kids are at school, that our kids are safe. I'm dealing right now with an issue where my son, uh, I brought him to school today. Uh, and this is just real world, right? Real time stuff going down. I get a call five minutes later. They're like, you didn't see the email at 1130 that we sent uh, that the fourth and fifth graders need to stay home. Uh, and apparently a kid in, their, in one of the classes that he is sort of connected to has tested positive for COVID. So if we, the great unlock for us is getting our kids back to school and feeling like the kids are, that we're safe. So one of the big issues that we're gonna to have to deal with going into session next year, which is in March, is how do we, how do we approach this issue? Although you know, there's several months to be between now and March, but we're gonna to have to ensure that we are passing laws and that we're putting in the right kind of, of funding and sources for, um, to ensure that COVID testing, COVID tracing, and that our school systems feel and the parents are feeling safe uh, and adequately supported in that level. Um, I'm going to make a big push this go around on Medicaid expansion only because we are in a financial uh, pickle as a state. We're financially strapped. Uh, we need to figure out how to expend our funding, uh, expend money and develop and build a budget. Uh, and I think Medicaid expansion, which we have kind of pushed to the side for several years, is perfectly suited for this point in time where we can uh, take down and draw down billions of dollars in federal, uh, federal dollars. Uh, to help us finance what is our healthcare system. These are dollars that we, they're ours. You know, this is, these are dollars we just haven't claimed. Uh, and we need them, and we need them, and it helps us uh, ensure folks across the state have access to healthcare. Uh, two, that our small businesses are going to need help in rebuilding, and a part of that is helping ensure that their staff have access to healthcare, uh, that have access to COVID testing and all these different issues that we're going to need in place. Um, and uh, we need to balance our budget. So all of these things to me make it seem like we can really make a big push on that. And then the third last thing with respect to healthcare policy uh, is uh, mental health care access, uh, which as all of us know, uh, COVID has not been easy and it's not been, it's, it can be trying on, on, on families and individuals emotionally. You have friends who are isolated and you know, lonely. Um, and we need to ensure that there's, there's true access in terms of really kind of reemphasizing that. So what we have in place in many respects, I would proffer to you, is a system where uh, uh, our healthcare and our behavioral and substance use disorder treatment sort of programs at the state are piecemeal. 
we don't have a comprehensive thing in place that we can really kind of go at and really kind of create. So uh, to that end, I'm, I'm very intrigued in working with a lot of uh, partners on, on that kind of issue. Great. Um, no, I mean, that was, that was a lot. And uh, I'm definitely gonna have a few follow-ups, but you know, I wanted to ask you specifically, obviously uh, COVID-19 has really affected us since the early part of this year. What have you learned through this time and what would you have done differently if you can go back um, and, and change your position as representative? Yeah, um, so we passed the budget back in March. March 3rd, 17th was the official day we passed the budget. And um, I remember us looking at that budget. And when we talked about COVID, the one thing that we said when we passed the budget is, oh, yes, we put aside $25 million for this issue on COVID. And when, 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 we, when we passed that budget, we were like, okay, we, we put some money in the budget, but there is nowhere near what we uh, expected in terms of, it, uh, of what we're dealing with. So we came back home and we realized quickly that there is a budget that we have passed that may not be not meet the needs of our state in terms of what we're dealing with with the pandemic. Um, look, as an elected um, and as someone who's been since March kind of just dealing with uh, a lot of air traffic control between our agencies and our constituents, uh, whether it is um, uh, licensure for medic medical uh, uh, nursing homes or L uh, uh, ALFs, uh, or just in general providers in this district who are trying to get their licenses and licenses uh, handled. Um, we have been doing a lot of that interfacing while the 800 pound gorilla, co which is COVID, is also raging at the, at the same time. So all of these things continue to spin and continue to move. So I, I would say, uh, what would I have wished uh, is that I, we, you know, hindsight is 2020. And I think that when you look at back to this, this point in time, um, you know, thinking about, about where we could have been and should have been in May, uh, if we really seriously wanted to open up the state, I think I really wish that we had gone to back to a special session back in May. And that special session would have included, yes, the unemployment system, we can do some tweaks and, and, and fixes there. But truly, 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 if, if the legislature was involved, we could have really kind of worked on what does an adequate contact tracing program look like? How do we finance it? What are we, what part, uh, what are what are the players and 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 what's the private pu uh, public partnerships instead of letting uh, just the governor kind of run through on it i think it would have been really good for us all to flesh it out because 120 minds in the house and 40 minds in the senate could really kind of pull and pick pick and pull and put together something that was a little bit more um uh, uh strategically created uh so that august came around and my kids are going to school and everyone else's kids are going to school that we had absolute confidence that what we have in place is something that can catch, uh, move, and, and at least figure out how do we can test, how we can, uh, we can uh, monitor all of these different situations. So to me, my biggest regret is that we weren't able to go back to, go back to Tallahassee and work on these issues together uh, to kind of work on, on, on what I think is, is so needed now and what we're seeing are some of the flaws with, with the system right now. Okay. And uh, with that being said, you know, if you're elected for a third term in the House, uh, how do you think, if we look forward, how do you think your role as a representative is going to be impacted moving forward if uh, COVID-19 persists and maybe gets worse? I've seen that the numbers, um, you know, have been going up around the world. If this continues to be true, how do you think uh, this will impact your role as a representative? Yeah, uh, well, I would say this. Um, the first is this. I think what I what I hope to do without passing policy is to help instill confidence that individuals realize that what we're doing as a nation that we all have to lean in. Uh, and I, I kind of liken where we currently are to if you think about back in World War II uh, and uh, when we had sent our troops to to Europe um, and we were sending them to the Pacific. Uh, we didn't have enough food. We didn't have enough supplies. We needed people to build and build uh, all of these um, planes and, and, and carriers and all of the different things. At the same time, educating our kids, uh, farming, all of these different pieces. Everybody in the, country, in the country had to lean in. And I really think that that's what we need to kind of, we need to get away from the politics of masks. We need to get away from the idea that contact tracing or, or, or testing is, is, uh, is political. 
We need to just sort of lean in as a country and say, we need to fix, we need to get out of this thing. And that we all have to lean in. And I think a, a bit of what we can do as electeds and officials is work to try to take politics out of this, like, you know, sober the politics and talk about policy and community health in ways that hears and listens and understands that we all have a role to play together. Um, there's that. With respect to policy and with respect to healthcare, you know, we have, we have uh, a system here in the state where we still have a lot of uninsured. We have one of the highest uninsured rates and the rate has grown. Um, and, and so it's not necessarily that we need to get folks, it's not it's just about having health insurance, it's about having uh, quality affordable health care. Uh, and so the idea of how do we reduce barriers for children and families? How do we ensure that the social service programs like kid care program are not creating fiscal cliffs where a mom of two children has to say, I have, I have to consider whether or not I take that three or $4 raise, because if I do, it puts me in an income level where I no, alum, I no longer am eligible for my kids to have health care, And now I have to figure out how to do that. Um, that doesn't help people move up. And that's what we need to be focusing in on. And a lot of the policy that I want to re really zero in on is ensuring that families can, we are, we are helping them move up, move up, move up, instead of trying to make these axiomatic sort of difficult decisions on, on, on where, who, they work, who they work for and, and ensuring that they're within certain eligibility levels for services. Um, so it's all about regrowing and rebuilding and building in confidence and making sure folks lean in on terms of community health. Sure. And um, you spoke briefly a few minutes ago about expanding Medicaid in the state of Florida. And as the executive director of the Florida Association of Free and Charitable Clinics, you help provide services to me uh, many medically underserved people in Florida. Uh, what do you think, other than what you've already done, what can be done to expand this outreach initiative so that people you know, can have access to the care that they need, especially during uh, the times of this pandemic? Yeah, uh, so, so the, the free and charitable clinic sector um, I came across them when I was in implementing the Affordable Care Act, when I was overseeing the, the, the program and, and the, uh, the campaign. And um, the reason I came across it is because uh, when we would have folks come to us who could not, were not making enough money or were making too much, we're making, uh, not, we're not making enough money, uh, but we're too, uh, the, the Medicaid gap. So they were, they were too poor, they were poor, but they were not making, they were making too much money. Uh, so they, fat, they sat in the middle and um, it just hurt, it bothered me and a lot of our, my staff across the state that we couldn't just say, sorry, good luck. Uh, so we worked to find what could be a good resource for individuals so that they could have some sort of, you know, a modicum of, of, uh, of ability to secure healthcare or to have a relationship with a doctor. And we came across free and charitable clinics. Now, what's unique about free and charitable clinics, since this is a health policy sort of group, um, is that they exist uh, because of sovereign immunity statute that was passed back in 1992 um, that, that provides and that, the, that, that really kind of fostered the idea to recruit medical professionals to volunteer their time. Uh, and uh, the lifeblood of a free clinic is the medical professionals who volunteer. Uh, and they volunteer because they are an agent of the state. They have sovereign immunity that allows them to provide free medical services to uninsured and working poor who are under 200% of the federal poverty level. Um, and, and, and so what I've seen from this is there are close to 240,000 Floridians who rely on this sector for their medical care. Um, and uh, it shows me that there is a population of people, these are working poor, like people who work, who go to work every day, who strive to try to do best for them and their family, um, that they, they could, uh, you know, the, the power of, of, like I said to you earlier on, economic security through healthcare, um, that if we could do it, these are the individuals who would probably benefit the most. No one is looking for a handout. This is about a hand up. And um, the Medicaid expansion is something where we can do that, save money for our overall spending as a state, and um, at the same time ensure that Floridians across the state have access to medical home, medical medicine, et cetera. I think that that's, that's something that Medicaid expansion positions the state of Florida to do it. 40 other states basically have done this. Uh, and it's, it's become, again, here's another idea. It's, it's not about a Democrat Republican thing. I think we need to take the ideology out of it. Okay, great. And you, you know, we we're paying a lot of attention to the, the physical aspects of COVID-19, right? But I think that 
to some extent, we're overlooking some of the mental health issues that come along with this pandemic. Um, during your career, you've helped fund some mental health programs. And because this last year has been anxiety ridden and traumatic for so many people, um, what more can be done to help people meet the health needs of mental health needs rather of Floridians? That's a, that's a such a great question, and you know I I would say this you know for one of the one of the silver linings of COVID has been the 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 speed in which we have adopted and moved forward and leveraged telehealth. So last year we had passed uh, a framework on telehealth that allowed us and allowed for the practice of telehealth here in the state of Florida in a way that uh, just positioned and created that. Um, that sort of uh, platform for us to do so. And one of the things you've seen is that it has been leveraged uh, in, in ways we've not seen before. And, and it's not like we've been talking about telehealth just this year. This is something that we've been talking about for several years now. Um, but what it does is show the value of it and shows the, uh, the ability to, to create access, particularly with mental health issues, um, I think this is something that the free clinic, the free and charitable clinics, we have been working on this issue for a while with uh, uh, on on expanding telehealth and leveraging technology to uh, create better access. And when it comes to telehealth, if you could literally just use this phone uh, and jump on and have to have access to a mental health counselor, uh, if it creates the less of the issue of trans of breaking down transportation, which transportation for most folks realizes one of the biggest reasons why people don't go to miss their appointments. Um, this is something uh, that I think is, is so, so important. Now, what, what I think we're going to be dealing with now is whether or not the insurance companies value uh, telehealth the same way that they value an in-person consult. Uh, and so you're going to have a lot of that conversation over the next couple of, of months. Uh, sometimes with regards to the parity issues, I'm assuming. Exactly, to parity. Uh, on whether or not it's worth the same amount and they should be reimbursed for the same amount. Uh, and the mental health counselor or the physician or the, the doctor would say to you, um, I still have to have an office. I'm sitting in this office. Uh, I still have to have this, I have to stop my staff who help me with my scheduling. I still have to have all of these different pieces. Uh, there's nothing different uh, with respect to this, to the, what I'm delivering in terms of the quality of the care that's being delivered. Uh, and I think that the idea of how many, so many people had to just deal with it and, and use telehealth for the first time uh, really kind of shows the value. Uh, and, and I think that we're going to have a lot of conversations. Now, I prefer that we don't, as a legislature, uh, have to uh, tell people that, you, uh, tell insurance companies that you have to reimburse at this amount. Um, but sometimes when the rubber meets the road, sometimes we got to kind of push, gently push uh, folks to do that. And I think that there's going to be conversations on that issue. Okay, and if we uh, stick with the theme of mental health, uh, with regards to op the opioid ep epidemic in the state of Florida, um, what effects has the controlled substance prescribing bill you passed in 2017 had in Florida? Yeah, um, so 2016, first time I was elected, first uh, first session, and it was an issue I, I mentioned to you earlier uh, you know, when we were conversing about this that. It's personal for me. I had my brother-in-law who passed away who had struggled with substance use disorder uh, for many years and uh, opioids is what uh, ended up being what, what killed him. Um, but it was an issue that uh, I dived deeply into in my first session because I wanted to understand how do we, how can we as a state be taking this on? There's obviously something we can do and do better. Uh, and, and the first was is to modernize the prescription drug mon monitoring program. Uh, that we had in the state since 2009. Um, but in it, and just like a lot of policy, you find old, uh, outdated uh, uh, requirements in things. And for instance, uh, for pharmacists were only had to re, were, were required to, they had seven days to submit the prescription um, data that they were having. They, they could take seven days uh, or they could submit that information by CD-ROM uh, and send it in the mail. Um, and to me, I'm just like, we're living in a, in, in, in a day and age where you can upload data like that and have it in front of you real time uh, and in the system. And I think that doctors uh, who are going to use that system uh, need to ensure that the system works, that it's easy to get into, that the data is good. And, uh, and if it's so, if you build it, they will come. Uh, and so that was the first piece of what we did. Uh, in 2016, we did that. We had a, ma a major debate on restricting 
the number of opioids in, a, in an initial uh, prescription to three days. Um, major debate. Uh, we won on that and had bipartisan support. And then the following year, we really kind of uh, put ironed it out. Um, but what you did see is this, uh, the system is being used far more meaningfully now. Uh, we have identified people uh, who are careening towards addiction uh, and we're helping them and we're accessing and we're helping direct them to, to, uh, uh, to substance use disorder treatment. Um, and, and the number of prescriptions have dropped dramatically. Uh, and so uh, I think the idea was to, uh, to really kind of create the tools, the framework that allowed um, our, our medical professionals to work within, but to also make and benefit them and the patient. Okay, and um, obviously we're here speaking today via Zoom. Uh, you touched on telehealth a few moments ago, online prescribing for uh, medications of this sort. Um, technology is really kind of, you know, ushering us into a new era. What long-term changes to the healthcare industry do you envision or do you think will remain in place after COVID-19 is over? So I, I've been reading this book um, called The Long Fix, uh, and I just started running through it, and, and um, I'm really looking forward to November 4th, uh, because I think November 4th will give me a time to begin to read, read for pleasure, read for thinking. Uh, and campaigning right now has been kind of hectic a little, uh, but uh, the book, the premise of the book is this, and I think uh, I'm fascinated to dive deeply into it, is that I think our healthcare system, um, regardless, it, it, and, and I bring it back to the idea that you have, we can, you can have, everyone can have health insurance. Uh, it's, it's about actually having access to healthcare uh, and the delivery of healthcare, but that our healthcare delivery system has been built on for years and years and years on a uh, pay for action, right? So you take, you do a particular service, we pay you. Uh, and, and, and uh, what we need to be doing is pay for outcomes uh, and shifting to a more of a pay for outcomes sort of system. So how do you do that um, with, configured the way it is uh, and how do we how can we how can we move towards that sort of uh, system that really brings us to a point where we're we're saving money and people are have quality care um, but what we're doing is we're ensuring that when we deliver care it's because we know that it's making that person better more more healthier uh, that they're less sick that they're not having to come to the doctor so much and I think one of the interesting pieces about the ACA was that they created those accountability organizations the ACOs that were focused on that we'll pay you we'll pay you X amount of dollars um, and if you do good you know, if you if you if you really that get that patient from having to have so much more services you'll get the back end you'll get the call you'll get the that, that cream that, that you're able to save on that and I think that how do we shift that kind of thinking on all levels is something that that I'm really intrigued about and how and how policies of different portions, whether it's not just the, simply the healthcare system, but uh, all of the different pieces of what builds it up, right? The, the, the basement floor for policy that helps kind of create that. And early on in the pandemic, um, there were issues with a shortage of PPE, ventilators, and other yeah. supplies, um, healthcare practitioners were sleeping in their garage because you know they didn't want to bring anything back home to their family. There was a lot of uncertainty. Um, but I'd like to ask you, you know, what more can be done to support healthcare professionals who are treating COVID-19 patients? So, and I serve on the board of the Jackson Health uh, System down here in Miami, uh, the largest public health system down in, in Florida. Uh, one of the largest ones in the country, and this has been an issue. You know, I work closely with uh, 1991 SEIU and uh, our other uh, friends that asked me uh, on this issue. And I remember early on how scared everybody was um, when it came to accessing PPE. And if you can just think back about six months or seven months, how finding a mask was quite a, quite a uh, just as an individual was, was pretty difficult to find, uh, to order online, etc. Uh, in particularly with with my clinics, the free and charitable clinics, I had to the association had to go in and find a reputable somebody we could trust who deliver to us uh, those things, the, the PPE. And I spent uh, you know tens of thousands of dollars becoming an Amazon, my mini Amazon 
uh, by buying this equipment, making sure it came, then repacking, just redistributing it to get to clinics. Look, I think we're in a better position now with PPE. Um, and, uh, it, and I hope and hope and, and believe that the, the ability to access PPE now is, is far greater. Um, and, uh, and, and so you'll see a lot more meaningful stockpiling. You see Jackson, you see Baptist, you see all the other healthcare systems. They have, they have taken on this sort of challenge of ensuring that PPE exists um, at a far greater level. But what does that really mean? It means that for now, while we are in a pandemic, um, we're going to have to, at a city, at a municipal level, at a county, at a state level, at a national level, kind of emphasize the ability to get access to it and whether that means incentivizing businesses to be here to do things, whether that means passing particular policies to ensure that, that this is a, a place of uh, where, where supply is, isn't ever going to be a called to question uh, and that we are meaningfully stockpiling for the future. Uh, we're going to have to have those kinds of conversations there. Um, and I think I may have meandered off the question, if you can repeat it again, the other, the second half of what you were asking. Yeah, so basically I was just saying, you know, what can we do to kind of better prepare and support healthcare professionals who are treating COVID-19 patients? Yeah, um, and the frontline workers um, have, you know, it's it's been tough. And I think if you go think back to July and um, August, they were having some tough times here in Florida and across uh, the state, but you know now we're seeing it in other states like Wisconsin, for instance. Um, it, it it is this one we we have to first ensure that as a as a state and and as municipalities and as healthcare systems that we're providing these folks with safety, uh, and that means adequate PPE. That means adequate testing. So as a state, can we are we supporting our healthcare systems with the funding and resources? Uh, do we need to be the coordinator? Uh, my friend Jared Moskowitz, who's the director of emergency operations, he has been sort of the czar on PPE and testing. Um, but then the second half to this is: Are we, you know, are we treating our staff meaningfully? Are we paying them right? Um, are we ensuring that their workers' compensation, that they're covered, uh, that their health insurance is covering it in certain ways? Um, that's the other side to this. I think that that um, is has been a driver uh, for a lot of folks. You know, there's a lot of people who are afraid, uh, tired, and like you said earlier, they had to for a while they had to sleep in other places or they had to use hotels uh, to to stay away from their families. Um, but uh, it, it's it's going to be a while, honestly. If I had to tell you how I felt where things are, I think we're going to be wearing masks and we're going to be talking about this issue well into early summer. Okay. So switching gears for a moment, um, let's talk about the election a little bit. You're running for your third term in the Florida House this November. If reelected, what are some of the things that you're hoping to achieve? Yeah, um, so going back to Medicaid expansion, I think I want to make a, a big push on that. I definitely want us to have a more meaningful contact tracing program. Obviously, the state of Florida has had one through the HIV program, but it was minuscule. It was tiny. It was outdated. It is outdated. And it certainly doesn't meet the, the, the merits of what we need at this place. So it's not necessarily, will we need contact tracing? Um, you know, we're talking about March. So what we're saying is really by July, can we have the funding in place for the budget? Do we have the policies in place that it will help us if it's COVID, but it will help us no matter what the next thing in front of us is, is that we think about what contact tracing looks like there. Um, I live down in Miami-Dade and I'm just kind of taking off I think there's an interconnection to it, but sea level rise and climate change are certainly interconnected in my book to our overall health and health of human beings. And, and for me, we have to really kind of at the state level become a bigger, far more uh, in, in involved voice and, and have a role when it comes to climate change. Uh, and, and so I think that that's going to be a major part of the next legislative session is how do we build, rebuild our economy? How do we ensure that what we're doing is greening our economy? Um, and so we have a lot of opportunity there, but I think it also is part and parcel with the health, uh, in that our, our healthcare system and the overall, overall, uh, uh health of, of human beings is interconnected to the, to the climate change as well. So I'll, I'll be working on that. Look, I, I do a lot of budget work. Uh, and to me, it's going to be about finding the, the, the money and the pennies and the dollars uh, in the different tranches, whether it's silent spending, which is you know, tax, uh, you know, tax breaks, or it is um, uh, new revenue sources that we're just not 
kind of considering like Medicaid expansion and or the uh, online sales tax and collecting on those things. We have a lot of needs um, and uh, we just need to find the funding and we need to prioritize what that funding looks like when we, when we put it down. Okay. And um, what, are, what are some of your concerns regarding the upcoming presidential election and how might this election impact healthcare policies one way or another, regardless of who's uh, in the White House on January? Yeah, yeah. So, like somebody who's a, a you know, as an advocate, my old uh, my old boss would say, you have to sometimes be a zealot, Nick. Uh, and I'm a zealot when it comes to healthcare and when it comes to the healthcare system. I think the Affordable Care Act, while like I mentioned earlier, has uh, some deficiencies, it's still a platform that can be built upon and worked on. So for me, my hope, my fear is that that we we end up having a, a Supreme Court overturning the Affordable Care Act, and we have nothing. You have an alternative. We don't have anything in place that's ready to go. Um, and the other, I, I'll, there's also maybe an opportunity there for us to rebuild. Uh, but um, I think um, that first and foremost, you know, it is early voting today. It is early voting, and if may, may, maybe many of you uh, woke up and braved the weather and went outside and, and sat in line, um, but lots of people decided to sit in line. And so for me, the first is this: is that our elections. They, they, they go smoothly, they go well, uh, they're transparent, that they're, there's integrity there, and that people feel confident to go out and vote, that their vote matters and that they know it and that they should sit in line and that their vote is gonna count. Um, so that's something that I, I think a lot about and concerned with with respect to how people are voicing, uh, using their, their pedestals and their, and their uh, bully pulpit to, to talk about the elections. Um, but after that, uh, I think it is whoever the president is in place, the, re the reality of it is, is there's still an enormous amount of people who cannot afford health care, who are, have health care and they just can't use it to access a medical doctor uh, or have any care. Uh, and so uh, we have to go to that, that drawing board and identify some of the top priority items that we can, where we can whack away, whether it is um, uh, medicines and, and whether or not the international medicine program is actually going to be able to exist. We passed the bill here in the state of Florida. I was high, highly skeptical. I voted in favor of it because I'm always for anything that might be able to allow uh, citizens to get access to healthcare cheaper. Um, and it's built on the idea that we can purchase medicines outside of uh, the country uh, at cheaper, but they're safe. And I keep emphasizing they better be safe part of that. Um, but that's an opportunity in a, uh, in a Trump re-election world. Um, if it's a Biden world, it's about re-emphasizing uh, the Medicaid program and how we fund our hospital low-income pool systems as well. Uh, and so I think uh, I'm going to be fascinated by who, who is the president. Uh, but either way, in the healthcare arena and healthcare policy, there's going to be quite a bit of dialogue, debate, and an opportunity that really kind of help us drive um, some of the new uh, policies that come into play. So let's go back to uh, voting for a moment. Uh, so many Americans, you know, have voted already this year, shattering previous records. Uh, many of them are voting by mail-in ballots, uh, whether they actually mail it in or physically deliver it yeah. to one of their polling stations. Do you believe that voting by mail-in ballots will be the new norm? Um, and do you have any reservations about this type of voting and the potential for voter fraud? So we have been voting by mail since the Civil War. Uh, and uh, voting by mail has been in place for years on end. Uh, and here in the state of Florida, our voting by mail program has always been looked at as, as a shining star. Uh, Republicans, Democrats, mainly Republicans for historically have been the ones who use the vote by mail program the most. Um, and in a COVID pandemic, that is still simply, we do not see a, any ending to it. Um, why not? Why not be able to take advantage of the opportunity to vote safely, vote securely, and get your vote counted? Um, and, you know, I voted by mail this, this election. I usually go early voting and I'll get in line. I like to do that. I like to, to mark it off and sit in the booth and do that. I like the feeling of it. Um, but I've spoken so much about voted by mail. I've learned so much about it over the course of the last uh, four or five months as we led into the primaries that I, I just said, if I'm going to talk about this, or I'm going to, we're, going to, we're going to bring this to the public, then I might as well practice what I preached. So I voted by mail, put it in the ballot, and I put it in the mail. I watched it. I tracked it online. You can track it nowadays online. 
Uh, and uh, you can see that it was received and that it was counted. Uh, and, and so for me, this is new. This is something that we have the opportunity, we get better at uh, with, with uh, years as they come along. Um, and, and I would say that uh, if you want to vote by mail, you should vote by mail. And you, I always say vote earlier so that you have time to cure any issues that may happen with your ballot. Um, but no one should feel uh, less secure that their vote will not count um, so, solely because of the, it's vote by mail. I think uh, uh, this is America. We're good at this. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if any of you, see, you like the West Wing, but the new West Wing special, I heard somebody say that a couple of times and it really rang to me because we have been voting for many, many years uh, and vote by mail and, and the number and the fraud is so small, uh, so small and smoke, so tiny in terms of in retrospect. Uh, that it is a timed and true practice that we have here in the United States of America. Great. So, you know, we're obviously trying to make voting more accessible to so many people throughout the state. Um, but you have a lot of young people who still aren't voting. You have a lot of, you know, older people, um, professional people who feel that their, do their vote doesn't matter for one reason or another. Um, and that could, you know, specifically could really impact uh, on a more local level those individuals who choose to sit out. What do you think can be done to increase voter turnout, whether, you know, in person or mail-in ballots, in, in local elections, um, particularly for the younger generation? Ah, uh, such a, it's a good, it's a good question. Look, I, I'm a millennial, as so I guess I'm 38 and I was born in 1981 and, and I'm, I'm on the outer edge of, of, of it, uh, I guess. But um, look, the older, you know, as a younger person, I remember voting when I was in, when I was 18. I remember voting when I was in college, waiting in line in college. Um, it, it is, it's hard, you know, I, I think there's just, there's like a saying I live by, it's, it's seek outrage daily, but do not be bitter. And by that, I mean that every day you wake up, there are things that are going to really, really just outrage you and make you really fester and feel really angry. Um, but it's, it's about channeling that anger uh, towards more positive use. So don't be bitter, put it to work. Go volunteer here, do, do work on an issue that you find important, that you, you think you can help change. And so I think a, a bit of it is civic engagement um, and getting, getting folks involved on issues in their community is something that I think is always gonna be a great way to, as a launching pad for younger folks to be like, I can be a part of something um, that's important. And then when you say you need a vote, voting is just another way of, of sharing that opinion of who you think, what you think is important. Um, so to me, it's going to be constantly about engaging people, not just simply on, on voting, but engaging them in the community because when they can see it for themselves, whether it's working on a, on a food line, uh, whether it's working a car line that's dropping food in people's trunks or uh, helping get uh, masks and things and PPE to folks, there's going to be a lot of those kinds of opportunities. And I think it's us just as, as uh, individuals, uh, a little older, uh, but saying, look, we, I trust that you can do these kinds of things. I think you can be doing these things. Let me empower you. So it, involving individuals on things is, is, a, is an important part of it. You know, outreach and engagement um, is, is first. Um, and look, the, the one thing about social media to me is it's been, it, it can be a, a great force of in division and creating uh, you know, this, this lack of, uh, you know, this major concern that nothing, that everything is wrong, that everything that is happening in this world is wrong and, or that there's so much we have to be skeptic, skeptical about. Um, and, and so I just sort of say to everybody, you got to reaffirm to people that their vote isn't, is important. It's, it's, it's a, an important, important right that was given to them. Uh, and one of the most important things you can do as an American uh, and so you should protect that franchise and you should protect your right and you should always use it no matter what. Um, I don't care who you vote for. Uh, oftentimes, if you don't live in my district, uh, if you're in my district, you can vote for me. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something we got to continue to push on people, the importance of it, the history of it. Uh, and, and, and I think that's it's just going to be a constant struggle for us as, as, a, as a nation, as state, and as communities. And you've touched on a lot of different things today, um, but I'd kind of like to maybe summarize some of the points that you've made. Um, you know, what are some of the changes that you foresee in the next 10 years that will affect those working in healthcare and health law specifically? Yeah, uh, first will be, and it's going to be a, a 
I think in the near future, whether the Affordable Care Act survives the Supreme Court. Um, and the second will be uh, who that president is right now, because I think that president sets the tone for what the health care system may look like for 10 years down the road. Um, look, we're, I remember starting to work on the Affordable Care Act in 2010, 10 years ago. Uh, and, and so here we are, we're at a, a monumental sort of point where we go forward with it, rebuild, or is it get decimated and we have to create something brand new? Uh, I think we are having, we're going to force ourselves to move towards a uh, pay for outcomes uh, system uh, and moving and expanding on that idea um, as opposed to pay for action. Um, and, and then I think that through a system like that, we can create better access to all uh, all individuals um, and and so I think you're going to see that as a part of it because technology has just moved so quickly and, and changes uh, how we leverage technology in the healthcare system uh, will be a major uh, force driver and uh, conversation starter as well uh, so I think those are those are those are going to be key key issues in, in how I see healthcare over the next several uh, years um, because what you have seen over the last plus couple of years is hospital systems um, have struggled a little bit more based on the policies that have passed at the state level that have helped kind of expand out the kind of care that's provided in a singular fashion. So you have your, uh, you know, in some states you have uh, ER emergency rooms that operate, you know, they're just standalone emergency rooms or you have, uh, urgent care centers now looking to expand a little bit further into what they're doing and delivering their care. Uh, so those kind of constant pu uh, struggle and pushing are gonna always be a part of, of the system. Uh, and you'll see that that kind of um, the competing theories of uh, capitalist uh, free market versus um, a, gar a guarded sort of uh, market system, uh, kind of like the ACA, uh, always in tension based on, on how people see it, and who's in power in the state of Florida. Um, and I want to ask you a question um, that I received from one of the attendees. Um, so you talked about telehealth earlier, and many of us are continuing to experience issues with broadband, which is a critical issue for telehealth. Are there any plans to actually force the ISPS to live up to their service quality promises or to allow more competition in Florida? Yeah, what an, what an excellent question. Um, and, you know, it's funny. You know, we, we are here in election time, and one of the things that I remember when I was running in 2016 uh, is I would go to early voting. I'd be out there early in the morning setting up my signs, and there was this person sitting up against the wall of the library in Shenandoah Library down here. And I'm like, hey, uh, good morning. Are you here to start work? And she's like, no, I'm actually trying to get a proposal out the door. Um, and this is where I get my internet connection from. So I have to come out here and kind of sit here and wait and kind of get this. To, to the go and 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 when you learn like a city that Miami has one of the largest digital divides uh, in the in the country uh, I think you you hit the nail on the head we're talking about we just talked about the idea of, of leveraging telehealth and technology but you can't do it if you don't have the, the infrastructure or the access uh, and so how we break down the digital divide uh, is going to be so critical and consequential over the next couple of years. One of the bills we did pass in the legislature two years ago, maybe three years ago, was a bill that would help facilitate 5G. There's always been this constant sort of um, uh, grind and, and division between the, co the communications companies and our cities and municipalities. Uh, if you want to put up a 5G pole somewhere, the, the bureaucracy from the county and the cities is there to ensure that it doesn't look like crap, uh, that it's not uh, in the middle of a sidewalk and create ADA issues. So there is this like complexity to how that looks and how that dance happened, but it's happened. Uh, I think the infrastructure is slowly coming into place in Miami. I was actually talking to some folks from AT&T and from Verizon, and I, I was so, so interested in understanding where are we now with the digital divide? Because the report that I read from FIU several years ago said we were in a, in a terrible place. Um, and I think we can get better. I think, like like you just said, if you don't, if we don't live up to those expectations, and there's still children and families who just don't have access to um, to to, to Wi-Fi and to 5G and to the into the tapping into the internet, then we're failing. And I think as a state, we prioritize the ability to have access to these things, and we can guide 
those kinds of policies that ensure that that's not, that that's the case. So we'll see. Uh, I, I I'm bullish that we're getting there, that the infrastructure will build out and we'll have it over the next several years. Okay, and I have time for one more question. And the final question um, is for you, obviously. What legacy do you hope to leave behind when your career in politics uh, comes to an end? Hopefully not anytime soon, but when it does come to an end, what are you hoping to leave behind? Um, I, you know, I don't know how long I'm gonna be in doing this for a living, uh, for, not even for a living, for a, as, a, as, a, as being a, a state elected, official. Um, I take it two years at a time. Um, but I, I do know this. Uh, when I got into this, I always realized that my time here is finite uh, and that I need to wake up every day thinking that I have a le one less day to make have an opportunity to make an impact. Uh, like I told you before, my, my mom, uh, watching her help and fight for her students uh, besides her two kids um, was something that said she was trying to make their lives a little better. Uh, to make their family lives a little easier uh, and help them have a platform to succeed and achieve just like everyone else. Uh, and so when it comes back down, when it comes down to uh, leaving, uh, my hope is that uh, I'm known for, uh, for being a, a, a person who came to the table, who worked hard to roll up their sleeves, policy oriented. But the, the end goal and the end result was is that we made policy that helped families, that we helped uh, individuals, uh, we helped kids uh, in, in getting them to succeed and to really reach for the future and, and, and uh, uh, you know, achieve as much as they can. Uh, and, and so I, my hope is that people will look back and go, Nick was, was the guy, guy who would work with everybody, worked really hard, and they got some great things done that really did help a lot of folks. We moved the needle uh, on, on important issues and, and really helped the state of Florida. Great. Well, you know, thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. This was a wonderful conversation. Um, thank you to Representative Duran for answering our questions and for telling us a little bit about yourself and your perspective on what's uh, occurring in Tallahassee and uh, throughout the state, quite frankly. Um, I'd also like to thank Jason Mehta for allowing me to take over the series for an episode. Um, I'd also like to give a birthday shout out to our uh, former chair, uh, Greg Cheers. Um, so yeah, with that, you know, be on the lookout on LinkedIn, Facebook, and in your emails for information about the next episode in our Fireside Chat series. If you'd like to rewatch this interview, it will be up shortly on the Health Law Section's YouTube page. You'll send an email announcement out. Um, please hit the subscribe button and bell notification so you'll know uh, whenever we post a new content. So thank you again and uh, have a great week, everyone.